Good to see you. Thank you so much for being here today. We're looking forward to Easter stuff. And this kind of commercial here for the Omaha campus, if you guys would uh, consider attending one of our Saturday services for Easter, we already filled up the lot today, and so that makes me really nervous because we need to find spaces for people who are far from God and that will be coming to Easter services. And most non-Christians will come to, on Easter Sunday, not Easter Saturday. And also, if you come to the Easter egg hunt, that is not a church service. <laughs> it's not... Either is going to a fish fry. That still, you can't, like, oh, hey, I went Friday. Um, so uh, hopefully you'll take oppor- uh, op- uh, advantage of the opportunities this year. Invite your friends. If they can, it, by the way, if, your friend, if you invite a friend and they say, well, Sunday's the only day we can go, come on Sunday with them. Uh, that, that's great. Uh, if, but, you know, we'd love to have you join us in Benson on uh, Thursday night and then uh, Saturdays here and Sundays as well. So it'll uh, be a fun season and hope that you will get after it. Please do. We weren't here last weekend and we had a really, really good excuse for not being here. Aspen Jade showed up uh, on the scene, wanted you to see her. Oh my goodness. That was my view on, I think, Tuesday morning. And uh, wow, uh, uh, cutest baby ever. Right, totally knocked it out. It's so fun, and she was just great. A highly intelligent kid already. I mean, just brilliant, uh, creative arts, all that stuff. Uh, really, you know, just yeah, super sweet. We just had a great time with her. Super hard to leave uh, their family in Austin, Texas, but uh, we really look forward already to the next time we try to figure out a way to get down there. Now, uh, that's really the main reason. It wasn't because of the text that was used last weekend. If you recall last week, it was like, uh, yeah. Now, honestly, it's like I plan my messages out a long ways in advance and kind of here's where we're going. And some of the texts that we look at is like, yeah, I can't wait. This is going to be great. This is going to be awesome. And then you look, it's like, "Mm, uh, yeah. So when Justin called a while back, he says, hey, we're trying to schedule a C-section for Nikki. Uh, Is there a certain weekend or what time? He's like, we could do this one or this one. I said, I know the one. Uh, I'll get Theo to preach this text. This would be great. He did a great job. And, and uh, you know, if you weren't here last weekend, we're just going to, I'm going to refresh a little bit on, on the text that he uh, talked about. But um, uh, you, you'll find out like, oh, yeah. So here we go. First Thessalonians. Yeah, and we are in a message series through a little book called uh, First Thessalonians. There's one and two. And this is, one, this is one. And there was a sequel. And so um, we won't probably get to the sequel, but because sequels are never really that good. You know, it's like, unless Rocky. No, I mean, some of them were good. Anyway, it was a little book written to Christians in uh, the city of Thessalonica. And the Apostle Paul had been there just a short period of time, and he tried his very best to gather Christians. I don't know how he did it. He figured it out. He, he was able to convert people to Jesus and then teach them all the kind of stuff, and he wasn't able to stay there very long. He reinforces his teachings with this little book here that we know as 1 Thessalonians. So here we are in chapter 4. We've been in it for a while. And we've got a few more weekends. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Finally, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to live in a way that pleases God as we have taught you. So that little phrase, as we have taught you, is going to be, it, it shows up multiple times in this little section. We want you to live in a way that pleases God as we have taught you. Now, I don't know how he did that, right? Because here he wasn't there very long. And these people had full-time jobs. And they're cooking and cleaning and eating and, and doing their stuff. And at the same time, he's able to somehow find people who want to buy into the teachings of Jesus. A massive change and a shift from where they had been in their life. The ramifications of their decisions were enormous. This is crazy. You lived this way already, and we encourage you to do this so even more. For you remember what we taught you by the authority. By the, so he invokes this. We taught you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. Not our, this is not my opinion. I'm not making this stuff up. We are under the authority of Jesus. God's will is for you to be holy. Now, sometimes people are like, I don't understand the Bible very well. I don't understand what the will of God is. How do you find out what the will of God is? And I'm like, what are you talking about? The Bible says it over and over again. It's not rocket science. He tells us. The problem, typically when I hear people say, well, I, don't, I don't know what the will of God is, I think you do. You just don't want to do it. 
I think you understand what the will of God is. You just like, oh, I don't know what the will of God is, so I don't, how can I be held responsible? Okay, here we go. Super easy. God's will is for you to be holy. Huh? God's will is for you to be holy. Well, what does that involve? So he said, comma, so stay away from sexual sin. Okay, then I'm out. You know, it's like, well, I, I, what, are you, what are you talking about, Paul? It's like, because you, can you imagine him communicating, communicating to people that the, Jesus died, rose again, you should follow him because nobody else done this. And, oh, by the way, we're not going to do some stuff anymore. What are you talking about, Paul? Well, you know, sexual sin. Uh, yeah, no. I'm not giving that up, dude. I got an arrangement. I'm fine. Kind of like it. <laughs> Why do you have to be so? I mean, I, I can only imagine some of the thoughts that were going through people's minds. God is, God's will is for you to be holy, so stay away from sexual sin. Then, what? Each of you will control your own body and live in holiness and in honor, not in lustful passion like the pagans who do not know God and his ways. Never harm or cheat a fellow believer in this matter by violating his wife or the Lord avenges. What? The Lord avenges all such sins as we have solemnly warned you before. So th this is not new. We warned you about this. I just want you to be sure, clear, crystal clear. God has called us to live holy lives. There it is again, not impure lives. Therefore, Anyone who refuses to live by these rules is not disobeying human teaching, but rejecting God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now, see why I gave that to Theo? Again, nobody was making eye contact last week. It was like, oh, no, no, yeah, whatever. Now, you're like, hey, you know, that's the Thessalonians. Came from a pagan background, a lot of mischief, a lot of whatever. Everything was free, like, whatever, no big deal. You know, their gods, their gods even were promiscuous. Their gods cheated on each other. It was just a teaching. Americans, we don't do this stuff. We're much more civilized. And yet, statistics tell us it's pretty, happens a lot. I read, uh, found out a poll that said that by the time you're 40 years old, 65% of men have had an extramarital affair, 55% of women. Like, ah, I don't believe that. Because this, I mean, we're skeptical about polls now, right? Otherwise, Hillary's our president. Like, ah, uh, I don't know. Can you trust these people? I mean, they're giving a small sample size. We have 350 million people. They're probably polling 1,000 what I do know, I don't know if it's, I don't know what percentage, but I do know that 100% of the time, we're going to get burned. We're going to get burned. So Paul is writing to Christians. He's not writing to non-Christians. This is not for people who are outside. The, this is for people inside the faith. And uh, uh, He's, he's trying the very best to get this figured out. So here, Proverbs chapter six, he probably have taught from this passage as well. The apostle Paul would have had this memorized. Uh, this is the wisdom, chapter, uh, wisdom book in the Old Testament. So uh, Solomon writes this, who has a lot of experience, by the way, with the women. Not necessarily great stuff, but he has some experience. And so he's writing to his boy and he's telling him, and he gets to chapter six where he kind of gets into this idea of, like, uh, of, of being pure. So here we go. My son, obey your father's commands. Don't neglect your mother's instruction. Keep their words always in your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, their counsel will lead you. When you sleep, they will protect you. When you wake up, they'll advise you. For the command is a lamp and their instruction is a light. Their corrective discipline is the way to life. Okay? It will keep you, these instructions will keep you from the immoral woman, from the smooth tongue of a promiscuous woman. Don't lust for her beauty. Don't let her coy glances seduce you. For a prostitute is going to bring you to poverty, but sleeping with another man's wife is going to cost you your life. 
Can a man scoop up a flame into his lap and not have his clothes catch on fire? No. Can he walk on coals and not blister his feet? No. So it is with the man who sleeps with another man's wife. He who embraces her will not go unpunished. Excuses might be found for a thief who steals because he's starving, but if he's caught, he must pay back seven times what he stole, even if he has to sell everything in his house. But the man who commits adultery is another fool, for he destroys himself, and he would be wounded and disgraced, and his shame will never be erased. Pretty rough words, pretty tough things to hear. Nobody tells you this. We lie to each other all the time. Christians lie to each other all the time about this. Now, I know a lot of you may have, in the room have had affairs, and you're feeling pretty bad right now. And it sucks every single time you're reminded of this. And you're wondering, when are things going to get a little bit better? <laughs> I need a hug from Jesus. Not yet. It says here that God will judge our sin. Nobody tells you that. Hebrews 13, verse 4 says, Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. These are New Testament passages. This is not Old Testament stuff. Are you telling me that if I'm a Christian and I have an affair, that God's going to do something harmful to me? No. He's going to do something terrible. You're going to get burned. We can do one thing. To stop this judgment, repent. It stops the judgment there. What will God do? I don't know. Every situation is different. Romans 1, 18 says, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So verse 24, he says, God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. It's one of the, I think, scariest passages of Scripture there is. That God gave them over, God abandoned them, and basically said, you can do whatever you want. That is God's judgment on us. You can do whatever you want. I mean, most of us, when growing up in our house, we're you know, like, hey, I want to do whatever I want, right? We told our parents, and, our, and every single parent, like, for the most part, would say, that's a bad idea. That's a bad idea. Let me, let me let, let, let's come up with a, no, you can't do whatever you want whenever you want with whoever you want, right? Because it's just a bad idea. So that's why parents, we put restraints and like, oh, wait, whoa, wait a minute. And, and, and again, part of the struggle is like when they leave, then they, you know, like, are they going to do whatever they want? Not that you're abandoning them over to that, but at, mo at some point you're going like, they're going to do what they're going to do. I hope that we can pick up the pieces when it's over. The scary thing here is God says, I'll, I'm just going to give you over to what you want to do. Even though there's warnings, that kind of behavior gets played out over and over again, distorts and confuses what a healthy family can be like, broken and sinful people. By the way, we're all that way. We're all broken and sinful people. And in fact, Jesus said this, okay, you may not have committed adultery, but you lusted after her. Same thing. None of us are immune from that. Because Jesus knows, where does most affairs start? Right here. It starts with the mind, the imagination, playing things out, pretending. We all have to fall on our knees. All have to repent. That stops the judgment of God, and it turns the corner and we're restored. That's why next weekend is massively important, right? Without the resurrection of Christ, our sins lay on our shoulders and we are crushed over and over again. He sets us free. Without Easter. That's why next weekend is super important. 
First John 1 9 says, but if we confess our sins, so here it is, we have to confess. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive it, our sins. And I love this. This is this is big deal. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, from all wickedness. If it wasn't for that little word, that three-letter word. Because sometimes we throw, to cleanse us from most of the things we've done. Not that, probably not that. Certainly not that. He, has, he says to you and to me, the same guy, right? He says, I, I, I'm gonna cleanse you from all, every single, every itty bit, big deal, little deal. Every thought is gone. That's the full extension of his grace. Now, we need to put some safeguards in place. If we play with fire, we're going to get burned. We linger a little bit longer in the gym after the workout, have a business lunch with a person we're somewhat attracted to. We need to stop some of that risky behavior. We're being reckless. And you can change. Here's something else not a lot of people tell you. Your marriage is worth fighting for. It is. Walk in holiness. Now, Paul transitions to another spot. <laughs> I'm finally getting to what I was supposed to talk about. <laughs> okay. Verse 9. But we don't need to write to you about the importance of loving each other, for God himself taught you to love one another. Indeed, you already show your love for all the believers throughout Macedonia. You're already making a difference. You're already making an impact. Uh, you're already making a, a difference in people you don't even know. Even so, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you to love them even more. You're just getting started. Make it, here you go. Make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business and working with your hands. Sounds like my mom. Right? But these are amazing instructions. He says, we already talked with you about this as well, right? So we instructed you about this as well. This is not a new information. I want you to live a quiet life. Mind your own beeswax. That, I don't know, that's what we said when we were kids. Mind your own bees. I don't know what that meant, but it did mean to get out of my face. Mind your own business and work with your hands. Then, here's the purpose, here's the reason why he says this, then people who are not believers will respect you, the way you live, and you will not have to depend on others. Now, it's quite possible that the Thessalonians had bought into the idea that Jesus was coming back and he was coming back soon. And we're gonna talk about the second coming of Jesus because he, he gets that to eight, on April 8th. So if you're at all interested in my theory of uh, when Jesus is coming back, um, because now that the Cubs have won the World Series, he's, it's, he can do it. Come on back. We're ready. Okay. So April 8th. But it's quite possible that the Thessalonians had said, you know, uh, Jesus is coming back soon. I'm quitting my job. Why should I work? I mean, he's coming back. I, wanna, I want a couple of weeks. Do whatever I want. Go to the beach. Take up a pottery class. I don't, don't want to work anymore. Well, a couple weeks later went by, a month or so. And the impression was that the Christians in, the, in Thessalonia we're lazy and busybodies. Because when you have a bunch of time on your hands, what you start doing? You get into other people's business. We call that Facebook now. <laughs> you don't have enough time, you get on like, oh, hey, oh, okay, yeah. Hey, did you see? Well, okay, and it's just being, we're being busybodies. We don't have enough, too much time on our hands. So he says, we need to live a quiet life. And again, I think the people in their city were getting turned off by the disruptive busybodies who were somewhat lazy. And they looked on these Christians with some sort of disgust. Now, it's quite possible that that's how people view us as well in our community. I don't know if this is fair or not, but you're being watched 
not by the government. This is, well, maybe, I don't know. Um, but people at work are watching you on your softball team, wherever, you know, where you do commerce. Or what, and they're watching you, and especially if they find out that you're a follower of Jesus. They see what you post, and they, you know, they hear the comments, and they see your work ethic. And I don't know if that's fair or not. I'm just telling you that that's happening. And um, people are watching. So again, the thing we would say is, live a quiet life and mind your own business. They kind of go together. Minding our own business. Gossip's a killer. It wreaks havoc in any kind of business or institution or church. Dave Ramsey, he has a no gossip policy at his business. He said it came about because he went into a room and a team member who did not know that Dave was standing right behind him was trashing Dave. Dave made a decision at that very moment. He didn't want to pay a guy to trash him while he was at work. So he came up with a no gossip policy. I, he says, I warned them one time, if it happens again, they're out. He says, if a company pays you and you feed your family and if you cannot be loyal to them, then you need to leave. If you are unhappy, keep your mouth shut until you leave. That seems harsh. But who doesn't want to work in a gossip-free zone? I think, uh, sign me up for that company. Yeah, that'd be great. By the way, sign me up for that small group. That'd be great. Sign me up for a church like that. That'd be great. What if we decided as Christ followers, we're going to mind our own business. Now, sometimes in the church, we pretend that it's because we care about the people. We should pray for them. Oh, really? What's going on? Well, you know, I kind of heard, uh, seriously? Yeah, I, th- I think we should pray. Okay. And all of a sudden, gossip, because there's a fine line between being helpful and being gossip. Being helpful is actually talking to the person. Being a gossip is talking about the person. Now, you're going to have problems at work. That's okay. You're not going to agree with everything that happens. That's okay. Some people are going to bother you, tick you off. That's okay. Here's what Dave says. You can't talk to the receptionist about the IT team. You need to take your negatives up and your positives down. It's a good advice. Let go of gossip. We know this from Jesus' teaching, Matthew 7, verse 3. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? Mind your own business. All right. We worry way too much about other people's lives and not enough about what's happening in ours. Minding our own business has tremendous amount, needs a tremendous amount of humility and politeness. Judging others is sinful. He tells them to work with their hands. It's quite possible, again, that they had just become lazy and, and uh, disruptive in the community. Paul has to say, we talked about this when I was there. I modeled for you a work ethic. I didn't even take money as a pastor. I worked my tail off building and making tents and so that I wouldn't even be of a burden to anybody. We were just getting, we had no money. We, had to, we were just getting started. I didn't. I worked hard, and we did this together. Colossians 3.23 says, work, dil- work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Just, if you don't like your boss, just change it. Work for the Lord now. I'm not talking work for the church. I'm talking that you, you now see your work as a, I'm going to work for Jesus. That seems weird, but I, work, I would work super hard for him. How do you get the attention of your coworkers? One of two ways. You get the attention of your coworkers by either being lazy or being a hard worker. Why would I pay attention to a Christ follower who doesn't work very hard? If you want to be a good witness at your work and be like, I want to be a good witness in my work. Absolutely. Here's what you should do. Work hard. Really? Yes. Work hard. Put the time in. I'm not talking like, hey, I'm going to out. But from 
these eight hours, I'm going to work hard for the paycheck I get, and I'm not going to be a problem. I'm going to not be a complainer. I'm not going to be a gus. And by the way, I think that when that happens, you will get the attention of people around you. So, so much so that eventually they might even say, um, hey, tell me about that church you go to. I go to Stonebridge Christian Church. I think you'd like it. The pastor's really funny. Like, he's awesome. You do get a bonus for that. I mean, it, at the end of the year, we send a little bit back of your giving, that kind of stuff. So anytime you, right? Especially if the, your friends start giving and that kind of So it, it, it's all workable, but we can talk about that later. But... Um, For instance, you know, if you have one of these cards and you're kind of lazy at work and you invite your friend to come to church with you, what do you think they're going to do with this? I'm paying attention. But if they see you as a person who's producing, who's making a difference in their company, making them some money, everybody's pretty happy, and you say, hey, we got this cool thing going on at Stonebridge, love to have you come. It's just possible that they might pay attention. Perhaps the most religious thing we can do this week, at Holy Week. Here we go. Mind your own business. Live a quiet life. Let's just try that. It's not that difficult. That, my friends, is walking in love. Let's pray. I thank you so much for Easter. It does make a huge difference. For some of us today, We might be sitting, but our hearts are laying flat on the floor. In sorrow and pain. We're so sorry. Please forgive. Please. Give us the courage to walk away from a situation or relationship. Help us to pick up the pieces if we need to do that. For some of us, we're just kind of close to that whole thing. It's, it's pressure in our marriages, relationships. We're not happy. We're too vulnerable. And we have not put any good safeguards into our hearts and our lives. And I pray that this might be a wake-up call today. But we are truly, truly thankful that you forgive us of all of our sin. And nothing, nothing that we have done had been withheld from the cross of Christ. You put it all there. And you buried it in the tomb and you gave us new life it makes all the difference in Christ we pray amen All right, you have a great week we look forward to seeing you this week blessings to you all see you next weekend